Chapter 19, Introduction to the Respiratory System. Learning Objectives. Describe the structures of the upper and lower airways. Explain the normal physiology of the respiratory system. Differentiate respiration, ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. Describe oxygen transport. Define forces that interfere with breathing, including airway resistance and lung compliance. Identify elements of a respiratory assessment. List diagnostic tests that may be preferred on, performed on the respiratory tract. Discuss preparation and care of clients having respiratory diagnostic procedures. Accessory structures. The diaphragm separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. On inspiration, the respiratory muscles contract. The diaphragm also contracts and moves downward, enlarging the thoracic space and creating a partial vacuum. On expiration, the respiratory muscles relax and the diaphragm returns to its original position. The mediastinum is a wall that divides the thoracic cavity into two halves. This wall has two layers of pleura, a sac-like serous, S-E-R-O-U-S, membrane. The visceral pleura covers the lung surface, whereas the parietal pleura covers the chest wall. Serous fluid within the pleural space separates and lubricates the visceral and parietal pleura. The remaining thoracic structures are located between the two pleural layers. Respiratory physiology. The main function of the respiratory system is to exchange oxygen and CO2 between the atmospheric air and the blood and between the blood and the cells. This process is called respiration. Ventilation is the actual movement of air in and out of the respiratory tract. Air must reach the alveoli for gas to be exchanged. This process requires a patent airway and intact and functioning respiratory muscles. Pressure gradients between atmospheric air and the alveoli enable ventilation. Air flows from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. Mechanics of ventilation. During inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and flattens, which expands the thoracic cage and increases the thoracic cavity. The pressure in the thorax decreases to a level below atmospheric pressure. As a result, air moves into the lungs. When inspiration is complete, the diaphragm relaxes and the lungs recoil to their original position. The size of the thoracic cavity decreases, increasing the pressure to levels greater than the atmospheric pressure. Air then flows out of the lungs into the atmosphere. Mechanics of ventilation continued. Neurologic control of ventilation. Several mechanisms control ventilation. The respiratory center in the medulla oblongata and pons control rate and depth. Central chemoreceptors in the medulla respond to changes in CO2 levels and hydrogen ions, H+, concentrations, and pH in the cerebrospinal fluid. They convey a message to the lungs to change the depth and rate of ventilation. Peripheral chemoreceptors in the aortic arch and carotid arteries respond to changes in the pH and levels of oxygen and CO2 in the blood. Diffusion. Diffusion is the exchange of oxygen and CO2 through the alveolar capillary membrane. Concentration gradients determine the direction of diffusion. During inspiration, the concentration of oxygen is higher in the alveoli than in the capillaries. Therefore, oxygen diffuses from the alveoli to the capillaries and is carried to the arteries. The concentration of oxygen in the arteries is higher than that in the cells. Thus, oxygen diffuses into the cells. As cellular CO2 gradients increase, CO2 diffuses from the cells into the capillaries and then into the venous circulatory system. As CO2 travels to the pulmonary yeah. circulation, its concentration is higher there than in the alveoli. Therefore, CO2 diffuses into the alveoli. 
Ventilation, again, terms related to respiration. Ventilation is movement of air into and out of the lungs sufficient to maintain normal arterial oxygen and carbon dioxide tensions. Inspiration is movement of oxygen into the lungs. Expiration is removal of CO2 from the lungs. Diffusion is transfer of a substance from an area of higher concentration or pressure to an area of lower concentration or pressure. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the alveolar capillary membrane and at the cellular level. Perfusion is the flow of blood in the pulmonary circulation. Distribution is the delivery of atmospheric air to the separate gas exchange units in the lungs. Alveolar respiration determines the amount of CO2 in the body. Increased CO2, which is present in body fluids primarily as carbonic acid, causes the pH to decrease below the normal 7.4. Decreased CO2 causes the pH to increase above 7.4. The pH affects the rate of alveolar respiration by a direct action of hydrogen ions on the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata. The kidneys contribute to maintaining normal pH by excreting excess H ions, which in turn keeps ser serum bicarbonate HCO3 levels near normal. The lungs and kidneys can combine to maintain the ratio of carbonic acid to bicarbonate at 1 to 20, fixing the pH at approximately 7.4. In a critically ill client, various homeostatic mechanisms compensate for alterations. In an attempt to maintain normal pH, two mechanisms may occur. The lungs eliminate carbonic acid by blowing off more CO2. They also conserve CO2 by slowing respiratory volume and reabsorbing bicarbonate the kidneys excrete more bicarbonate. A client's condition remains compensated if the carbonic acid to bicarbonate ratio remains 1 to 20. Disturbances in pH that involve the lungs are considered respiratory. Disturbances in pH involving other mechanisms are termed metabolic. At times, respiratory and metabolic disturbances coexist. alveolar respiration. In this picture, A is the normal ratio. In the healthy lung, a given amount of blood passes an alveolus and is matched with an equal amount of gas. The ventilation perfusion, or BQ ratio, is 1 to 1. Ventilation matches perfusion. In B, this is a low BQ ratio. Shunt's low BQ states that states may be called shunt producing disorders. When perfusion exceeds ventilation, a shunt exists. Blood bypasses the alveoli without gas exchange occurring. This is seen with obstruction of the distal airway such as pneumonia, atelectasis, tumor, or mucus plug. C is also a high, excuse me, a low, a high BQ ratio as opposed to low. Dead space. When ventilation exceeds perfusion, dead space results. The, al the alveoli do not have an adequate blood supply for gas exchange to occur. This is characteristics of a variety of disorders, including pulmonary emboli, pulmonary infarction, and cardiogenic shock. D is silent. In the absence of both ventilation and perfusion, or with limited ventilation and perfusion, a condition known as a silent unit occurs. This is seen with pneumothorax and severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. Transport of gases. Oxygen transport occurs in two ways. A small amount is dissolved in water in the plasma, and a greater portion combines with hemoglobin in red blood cells. When hemoglobin is in red blood cells, it's called oxyhemoglobin. Dissolved oxygen is the only form that can diffuse across cell cellular membranes. As this oxygen crosses cellular membranes, oxygen from the hemoglobin rapidly replaces it. Large amounts of oxygen are transported in the blood as oxyhemoglobin. The formula for this process is O2 plus HGB, which is hemoglobin, becomes hemoglobin. H becomes 
oxyhemoglobin, Hb, HgBO2. Again, O2 plus HgB equals HgBO2. CO2 diffuses from the tissue cells to the blood. Bicarbonate ions, HCO3 negative, are then transported to the lungs for excretion. Most of the CO2 enters the red blood cells, although some combines with hemoglobin to form carbaminohemoglobin. Much of the CO2 combines with water in the cells and exits as bicarbonate, which the plasma transports to the kidneys. A small portion remains in the plasma and is called carbonic acid. The formation of carbonic acid yields hydrogen ions. A small portion remains in the plasma and is called carbonic acid. The formation of carbonic acid yields hydrogen ions. The amount of hydrogen ions determines the pH, which also determines the amount of CO2 for the lungs to excrete. Briefly, acid-base imbalances are compensated in the following ways. Respiratory acidosis. The kidneys retain more bicarbonate to raise the pH. Respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys excrete more bicarbonate to lower the pH. Metabolic acidosis, the lungs blow off CO2 to raise pH. And metabolic alkalosis, the lungs retain CO2 to lower pH. Pulmonary perfusion. Perfusion refers to blood supply to the lungs, through which the lungs receive nutrients and oxygen. The two methods of perfusion are the bronchial and pulmonary circulation. The bronchial circulation. The bronchial arteries, which supply blood to the trachea and bronchi, arise in the thoracic aorta and intercostal arteries. The bronchial arteries also supply the lungs supporting tissues, nerves, and other layers of the pulmonary arteries and veins. This circulation returns either to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins or to the superior vena cava through the bronchial and azygos veins. Bronchial circulation is not involved with gas exchange. Pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary artery transports venous blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. It divides into the right and left branches to supply the right and left lungs. The blood circulates through the pulmonary capillary bed where diffusion of oxygen and CO2 occurs. The blood then returns to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary circulation is referred to as a low pressure system. This means that gravity, alveolar pressure, and pulmonary artery pressure affect pulmonary perfusion. A person in an upright position has less perfusion to the upper lobes. If a person is in a sideline position, perfusion is greater to the dependent side. In addition, Increased alveolar pressure can cause pulmonary capillaries to narrow or collapse, affecting gas exchange. Decreased pulmonary artery pressure results in decreased perfusion to the lungs. Clients with lungs and cardiovascular diseases may have decreased pulmonary perfusion. Ventilation perfusion ratio. A client's cardiopulmonary status involves several factors. The client's ventilation slash perfusion ratio, called V slash Q ratio, indicates the effectiveness of airflow within the alveoli, which is the ventilation, and the adequacy of gas exchange within the pulmonary capillaries, which is the perfusion. The problems in respiratory physiology comes next. Question one. Movement of air in, to, and out of the lungs sufficient to maintain normal arterial oxygen and carbon dioxide tensions is termed A, perfusion, B, ventilation, C, diffusion, or D, inspiration. Your answer should be B, as in boy, ventilation. The rationale is the ventilation is the actual movement of air in and out of the respiratory tract. This process requires a patent airway and intact and functioning respiratory muscles. Problems in respiratory physiology. The respiratory system usually has sufficient reserves to maintain the normal partial pressures or tension of oxygen and CO2 
in the blood during times of stress. Respiratory insufficiency develops if there is too much interference with ventilation, diffusion, or perfusion. Abnormalities in this process can be leading to hypoxia, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and hypocapnia. Hypoxia is decreased oxygen in inspired air. Hypoxemia is decreased oxygen in the blood. Hypercapnia is increased carbon dioxide in the blood. And hypocapnia is decreased carbon dioxide in the blood. Several factors influence the work of breathing. Pressures need, needed to overcome the forces interfering with breathing determine the respiratory effort needed. Forces that interfere with breathing include airway resistance and lung compliance. Airway resistance is related to airway diameter, the rate of airflow, and the speed of gas flow. As the rate of breathing increases, so does the resistance. A narrowed airway results from increased or thick mucus, bronchospasm, or edema. Conditions that may alter bronchial diameter and affect airway resistance include contraction of bronchial smooth muscle, such as in asthma, thickening of bronchial mucosa, such as chronic bronchitis, airway obstruction by mucus, a tumor, or a foreign body, and loss of lung elasticity, uh, decreased surfactant, fibrosis, edema, and atelectasis, electis, which is alveolar collapse, affect lung compliance. Greater pressure gradients are needed when lungs are stiff. Gerontological considerations, again, cartilage in the nasal septum increases in length and can harden, which changes airflow. Alveoli walls become thinner and contain fewer capillaries, decreasing gas exchange. Lungs lose elasticity, which causes diminished lung expansion. Muscle tone, cough reflex, and cilia all decrease. And elderly are also at risk for increased risk for respiratory disease. Question, excuse me, assessment. History. General health is the family history of respiratory disease and the frequency of respiratory illnesses, allergies, and smoking history. Often a client seeks medical attention because of respiratory problems related to one or more of the following dyspnea, labored or difficult breathing, pain and inspiration, increased or more frequent cough, increased sputum production or change in the color or consistency of the mucus, wheezing or hemoptysis, which is blood in the sputum. The nurse obtains information about the client's general health history and family history and asks the client about the frequency of respiratory illnesses, allergies, smoking history, nature of any cough, sputum production, and dyspnea and wheezing. Questioning the client about respiratory treatments or medications, which include prescription and over-the-counter, is essential. In addition, the nurse inquires about recent pulmonary tests, such as chest x-rays, TB tests, etc., including questions about occupation, exercise tolerance, pain, and level of fatigue. Questions for the client with dyspnea or shortness of breath. What makes you short of breath? Do you cough when you are short of breath? Do you have other symptoms when you are short of breath? Do you get short of breath suddenly or gradually? When do you usually have difficulty breathing? Can you lie flat in bed? Can you or do you get short of breath when you rest? With exercise, running, climbing stairs, how far can you walk before you get short of breath? How severe is the shortness of breath on a scale of 1 to 10? One is not breathless at all, and ten is very breathless. And how hard is it to breathe? Physical examination begins with a general examination of overall health and condition. Clients with respiratory problems may show signs of shortness of breath when speaking, or they may have a certain posture or position to facilitate breathing. Other observations include skin color, level of consciousness, mental status, respiratory rate, depth, effort, and rhythm, use of accessory muscles, and shape of the chest and symmetry of chest movement. Extremities are assessed for finger clubbing, a condition in which the tips of the fingers or toes 
are enlarged because the soft tissue beneath the nail beds is increased. Although it is not always clear why this occurs, it may be related to levels of proteins that stimulate blood vessel growth or to genetic factors. Finger clubbing seems to occur with some lung diseases such as lung cancer, but not with others such as asthma. It can also occur with congenital heart, liver, and thyroid diseases. The nurse inspects the nose for signs of injury, inflammation, symmetry, lesions, and examines the posterior pharynx and tonsils with a tongue blade and pen light. Nurses note documents, do, notes document any evidence of swelling, inflammation, or exudate, changes in the color of the mucous membranes, and any difficulty with swallowing or hoarseness. A healthcare provider inspects the larynx either directly with a laryngoscope or indirectly with a light and laryngeal mirror. Both procedures require a local anesthetic to suppress the gag reflex and reduce discomfort. The nurse inspects and gently palpates the trachea to assess for placement and deviation from the midline, noting any lymph node enlargement. The nurse also examines the anterior, posterior, and lateral chest walls for lesions, symmetry, deformities, skin color, and evidence of muscle weakness or weight loss. Checking the contour of the chest walls is important. Normally, the anterior posterior diameter of the chest wall is half the transverse diameter. However, some pulmonary conditions, such as emphysema, change the chest dimensions. An experienced nurse palpates the chest wall to detect tenderness, masses, swelling, or other abnormalities. Tactile or vocal fremitus, which is vibrations from the client's voice transmitted to the examiner's fingers, depends on the capacity to feel sound through the fingers and palm placed on the chest wall. The palpable vibrations occur when the client speaks. The examiner uses the palmar surface of the fingers and hands to palpate and asks the client to repeat 99 as the examiner moves his or her hands. If the client is healthy and thin, the fremitus will be highly palpable. Conditions that affect fremitus include a thick or muscular chest wall, which is going to cause decreased fremitus. Lung diseases such as emphysema and pneumonia are going to cause increased fremitus. And fluid, air, or masses in the pleural space decrease fremitus. The experienced nurse performs percussion of the chest wall to assess normal and abnormal sounds. With the client sitting, the examiner places his or her middle finger on the chest wall and taps that finger with the middle finger of the opposite hand. In your Timby book, page 288, describes the type of sounds heard with percussion. The experienced nurse auscultates breath sounds from side to side, moving from upper to the lower chest. He or she listens anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly. Normal breath sounds include the following. Normal breath sounds include the following. Vesicular sounds. Produced by air movement in the bronchioles and alveoli, these sounds are heard over the lung fields. They are quiet and low-pitched with long inspiration and short expiration. Bronchial sounds. Produced by air movement through the trachea. These sounds are heard over the trachea and are loud with long expiration. Bronchovesicular sounds, these normal breath sounds are heard between the trachea and upper lungs. The pitch is medium with equal inspiration and expiration. Adventitious or abnormal breath sounds are categorized as crackles or wheezes. Crackles, formerly called rails, are discrete sounds that result from the delayed opening of deflated airways. They resemble static or the sound made by rubbing hair strands together near one's ear. Sometimes they clear with coughing. They may be present because of inflammation or congestion. Crackles that do not clear with coughing may indicate pulmonary edema or fluid in the alveoli. Wheezes may be sibilant, which is defined as hissing or whistling, or sonorous, which is defined as full and deep. Sibilant wheezes, formerly called wheezes, are continuous musical sounds that can be heard during inspiration and expiration. They result from air passing through narrowed or partially obstructed air passages 
and are heard in clients with increased secretions. Sonorous wheezes, formerly called ronchi, are lower pitched and are heard in the trachea and bronchi. Friction rubs are heard as crackling or grating sounds. Breath sounds. When performing a respiratory assessment, a nurse can distinguish between breath sounds by auscultating specific regions of the lung. Breath sounds are not distingu distinguished by inspiration or expiration. Friction rubs are heard as crackling or grating sounds on inspiration or expiration. They occur when the pleural surfaces are inflamed and do not change if the client coughs. Sounds heard with chest wall percussion. If you're percussing and you hear a flat sound, which is a high pitched, little intensity and decreased duration, this is heard during percussion of a solid area, such as a mass or pleural effusion. A dull sound, which is medium pitch, medium intensity, and medium duration, is heard when no air or fluid is in the lung, such as atelectasis or lobar pneumonia. Tympanic is a high pitch, loud intensity, and long duration. Normal sounds heard over stomach and bowel. Abnormal sounds heard over lungs, such as in a pneumothorax. Resonant is low pitched, loud intensity, long duration. This is normal lung sounds. Hyperresident is lower pitch, very loud, and longer duration. These are abnormal sounds that occur when free air exists in the thoracic cavity in cases of emphysema and pneumothorax. While conducting the physical examination during assessment of the respiratory system, which of the following would describe lung sounds produced by air movement through the trachea and are loud with long expiration? Are they bronchovesicular? Are they bronchial sounds? Are they sonorous wheezes? Or are they vesicular sounds? The answer is bronchial sounds. Normal bronchial lung sounds are auscultated over the trachea and are loud with long expiration. Adventitious lung sounds can be heard at this website, www.easyauscultation.com. Look for adventitious breath sounds and listen to some. Crackles, again, formerly called rails, resemble static or the sound made by rubbing hair strands together in one's ear. Sometimes they clear with coughing. Wheezes are sibilant, which is hissing or whistling, or sonorous, which is full and deep. Heard when heard during inspiration and expiration. Sonorous wheezes, formerly called ronchi, are lower pitched and heard in the trachea and bronchi. And friction rubs are heard as crackling or grating sounds on inspiration and expiration. Diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests. Arterial blood gases, oxygenation of body tissues depends on the amount of oxygen in the arterial blood. Arterial blood gases, called ABGs, determine the blood's pH, the oxygen carrying capacity, and levels of oxygen. CO2 and bicarb, also in the ABGs. So in ABGs, you get the blood pH, the oxygen carrying capacity, the level of oxygen, the CO2 level, and the bicarb level. Blood gas samples are obtained through an arterial puncture at the radial, brachial, or femoral artery. A client may also have an indwelling arterial catheter from which arterial samples are obtained. If an arterial blood sample cannot be obtained, a mixed venous sample will be used, adjusting for normal values for mixed venous blood. The ABGs frequently are ordered when a client is acutely ill or has a history of respiratory disorders. If the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, which is PaO2, is decreased, body tissues do not receive sufficient oxygen. Clients with respiratory disorders can neither get oxygen into the blood nor CO2 out of the blood. Some conditions that affect ABGs are as follows. Hyperventilation during collection of ABGs causing an elevated PaO2. Hypoventilation 
with neuromuscular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease called COPD, or insufficient oxygen in the atmosphere causing decreased partial pressure of oxygen. Elevated PaCO2 in clients with COPD, inadequate ventilation with a mechanical ventilator, or decreased respiratory rates causes elevated PaCO2. Decreased PaCO2 occurs in clients who are nervous or anxious or have a condition that causes hyperventilation or a rapid respiratory rate. Pulse ox is a non-invasive method that uses a light beam to measure the oxygen content of hemoglobin, which is the arterial oxygen saturation, abbreviated SAO2. The monitoring device attaches to the client's earlobe or fingertip and connects to the oximeter monitor. The monitor registers wavelengths of light passing through the earlobe or fingertip and uses them to calculate the SAO2. Normal values are 94% or higher. Normal values for arterial blood of pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Normal values of mixed venous blood is 7.32 to 7.42. Partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, normal values are 80 to 100 millimeters mercury. Normal values of mixed venous blood is 38 to 52 millimeters mercury. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood known as PaCO2. Normal values are 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Values with mixed venous blood is 24 to 48 millimeters mercury. Bicarbonate ion concentration in the blood, HCO3 negative. Normal values are 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter and 19 to 25 milliequivalents per liter for mixed venous blood. SAO2 is the percentage of arterial oxygen saturation or percentage of the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood should be greater than 94 percent and normal values for mixed venous blood is 65 to 75 percent. Pulmonary function studies. Pulmonary function studies measure the functional ability of the lungs. These studies are done to diagnose pulmonary conditions and to assess pre operative respiratory status. They may also be used to determine the effectiveness of bronchodilators or to screen employees who work in environments that are hazardous to pulmonary health. Measurements of pulmonary function are obtained with a spirometer and include the following. Tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled and exhaled with a normal breath. Inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air that normally can be inspired. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air that normally can be exhaled by forced expiration. Residual volume is the volume of air left in the lungs after maximal expiration. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be expired after maximal inspiration. Forced vital capacity is the amount of air exhaled forcefully and rapidly after maximal inspiration. Inspiratory capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be inhaled after normal expiration. Functional residual capacity is the amount of air left in the lungs after a normal expiration. Total lung capacity is the total volume of air in the lungs when maximally inflated. Pulmonary function tests vary according to age, sex, weight, and height. The maximum lung capacities and volumes are best achieved when the client is sitting or standing. The test should not be performed within two hours after a meal. The nurse explains the procedure to the client and instructs him to or her to wear loose-fitting clothing. A nose clip prevents air from escaping through the client's nose when blowing into the spirometer. Bronchodilators may be used after the initial spirometry to see if there is any improvement or response with the inhaled medication. Although the test is simple, the client may be tired afterward. Sputum studies. Sputum specimens are examined for pathogenic microorganisms and cancer cells. Culture and sensitivity tests are done to diagnose infections and prescribe antibiotics. Negative results on, on the examination of sputum smears do not always indicate the absence of disease, so collection of sputum for successive days may be necessary. 
Sputum is collected by having the client expectorate, expectorate a specimen, by suctioning the client, or during a bronchoscopy. Collecting a sputum specimen. Explain the procedure to the client. Collect a sputum specimen early in the morning or after an aerosol treatment. Collect the specimen in a sterile specimen container. Instruct the client to rinse the mouth with tap water. Instruct the client to take several deep breaths, cough forcefully, and expectorate into the container. Collect at least one to three milliliters, which is a half a teaspoon. Deliver the specimen to the laboratory as soon as possible. The container should be transported in a sealed plastic bag with the appropriate requisition slip. Examination of this diagram. Again, we'll go over the definitions. The tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled and exhaled with a normal breath. So look at this picture. Inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air that normally can be inspired. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air that normally can be exhaled by forced expiration. Residual volume is the volume of air left in the lungs after maximal expiration. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be expired after maximal inspiration. Forced vital capacity is the amount of air exhaled forcefully and rapidly after maximal inspiration. Inspiratory capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be inhaled after normal expiration. Functional residual capacity is the amount of air left in the lungs after a normal expiration. Total lung capacity is the total volume of air in the lungs when maximally inflated. Pulse oximetry is the measurement of the oxygen content of hemoglobin. It measures oxygen saturation, SpO2, of arterial blood. Performing pulse oximetry. Explain the procedure to the client. Assess potential sensor sites for quality of circulation, swelling, tremor, restlessness, nail polish, or artificial nails. Review the medical history for data including vascular or other pathology such as anemia or carbon monoxide poisoning. Check prescribed medications for vasoconstrictive effects. Assess the client's understanding of pulse oximetry. Position the sensor so that the light emission is directly opposite the detector. Observe the numeric display, audible sound, or waveform on the oximeter. Set the high and low alarms according to the manufacturer's directions. Portable pulse oximetry is used to measure oxygen saturation, which is SpO2 of arterial blood. Diagnostic tests. Imaging studies. Chest x-ray shows the size, shape, and position of the lungs and any other structures of the thorax. Their purpose is to screen for asymptomatic disease and diagnose tumors, foreign bodies, and other abnormal conditions. Fluoroscopy enables the physician to view the thoracic cavity with all its contents in motion. It more precisely diagnoses the location of a tumor or lesion. CT or computed tomography scanning or MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, may be used to produce axial views of the lungs to detect tumors and other lung disorders during early stages. Pulmonary angiography. Pulmonary angiography is a radioisotope study that allows the physician to assess the arterial circulation of the lungs, particularly to detect pulmonary emboli or any other abnormalities. A catheter is introduced into an arm vein and threaded through the right atrium and ventricle into the pulmonary artery. Contrast medium is rapidly injected into the femoral artery and x-rays are taken to see the distribution of the radioopaque material. During pulmonary angiography, the nurse obtains data about the client's level of anxiety and knowledge of the procedure. The nurse provides explanations and reinforces the client's understanding. The client will experience a feeling of pressure on catheter insertion. When the contrast medium is infused, the client will sense a warm, flushed feeling and an urge to cough. The nurse must determine if the client has any allergies, particularly to iodine, shellfish, or contrast dye. During the procedure, the nurse monitors for signs and symptoms of allergic reactions to the contrast dye, such as itching, hives, or difficulty breathing. Infusion of contrast dye is discontinued immediately if the client has an allergic reaction. 
After the procedure, the nurse inspects the puncture site for swelling, discoloration, bleeding, or hematoma. The nurse assesses distal circulation and sensation to ensure that circulation is unimpaired. If bleeding occurs, the pressure must be applied to the site. The nurse must notify the physician about diminished or absent distal pulses, in other words, the feet, cool skin temperature in the affected limb where they did the femoral artery stick, poor capillary refill, client complains of numbness or tingling, and bleeding or hematoma. The client remains on bed rest for two to six hours after the procedure. The pressure dressing applied after the catheter is removed remains in place for this period. Lung scans. Several types of lung scans may be done for diagnostic purposes. The ventilation perfusion scan, called VQ scan, the gallium scan, or the positon emission tomography, which is the PET scan. The VQ scan requires the use of radioisotopes and a scanning machine to detect patterns of blood, throw th blood flow through the lungs and patterns of air movement and distribution in the lungs. VQ scans are particularly useful in diagnosing pulmonary emboli. They're also used to diagnose lung cancer, COPD, and pulmonary edema. A radioactive contrast medium is administered intravenously for the perfusion scan and by inhalation as a radioactive gas for the ventilation scan. Before the perfusion scan, nurses must assess the client for allergies to iodine. During the procedure, the radiologist asks the client to change positions. During inhalation, the client may need to hold his or her breath for short periods as scanning images are obtained. The client must receive adequate explanations before the procedure to reduce anxiety. The nurse must reassure the client that the amount of radiation from this procedure is less than that used during a chest x-ray. A gallium scan is used to determine if any inflammatory conditions exist within the lungs or if abscesses, adhesions, or tumors are present. Clients receiving an IV injection of gallium, a radioisotope, then they have the scans taken at various intervals up to 48 hours after the gallium injection. The scan shows gallium uptake by the lung tissues. A PET scan also uses radioisotopes with advanced technology that allows the examiner to differentiate normal and abnormal tissue and view metabolic changes within the lung tissue. This scan can evaluate malignancies by showing blood flow and other functioning of organs and tissues. Bronchoscopy is used to diagnose, treat, or evaluate lung disease, obtain a biopsy of a lesion or tumor, obtain a sputum specimen, perform aggressive pulmonary cleansing, or remove a foreign body. Bronchoscopy allows for direct visualization of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Fiber optic bronchoscopy uses a flexible fiber optic bronchoscope, which allows for more thorough visualization of the smaller and more peripheral airways. The physician introduces the bronchoscope through the nose or mouth or, or through a trache tracheostomy or artificial airway. Rigid bronchoscopy uses a hollow metal tube with a light at the end for removing foreign bodies or diseased tissue or visualizing sources of massive bleeding. Bronchoscopy is very frightening to clients who require thorough explanations throughout the procedure. For at least six hours before the bronchoscopy, the client must abstain from food or drink to decrease the risk of aspiration. Risk is increased because the client receives local anesthesia, which suppresses the swallow, cough, and gag reflexes. The client receives medications before the procedure, usually atropine to dry secretions and a sedative or narcotic to depress the vagus nerve. This consideration is important because if the vagus nerve is stimulated during the bronchoscopy, hypotension, bradycardia, or arrhythmias may occur. Other potential complications include bronchospasm or laryngospasm secondary to swelling or edema, hypoxemia, bleeding, perforation, aspiration, cardiac arrhythmias, and infection. Laryngoscopy provides direct visualization of the larynx using a laryngoscope. It is done to diagnose lesions, evaluate laryngeal function, and determine any inflammation. Physicians may also dilate laryngeal strictures and biopsy lesions. Mediastinoscopy. Mediastinoscopy provides visualization of the mediastinum and is done under local or general anesthesia. 
The physician makes, physician makes an incision above the sternum and inserts a mediastinoscope. With this procedure, the physician can visualize lymph nodes and obtain biopsy samples. Possible complications include arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, pneumothorax, and bleeding. Thoroscopy allows for examination of the pleural cavity. Small incisions are made into the pleural cavity through an intercostal space. An endoscope is inserted to visualize a specific area. The location selected is based on other clinical and diagnostic findings. If fluid is present, the examiner aspirates it and sends it for culture and cellular studies. Biopsies may also be done. A chest tube may be inserted following the procedure. Thoroscopy is done to evaluate pleural effusions and pleural diseases and for staging of tumors. Future potential exists for laser treatment of pulmonary nodules and other growths. This technique is less invasive than thoracotomy procedures. Thoracentesis. A small amount of fluid lies between the visceral and parietal pleura. When excess fluid or air accumulates, the physician aspirates it from the pleural space by inserting a needle into the chest wall. This procedure, called thoracentesis, is performed with local anesthesia. Thoracentesis also may be used to obtain a sample of pleural fluid or a biopsy specimen from the pleural wall for diagnostic purposes, such as a culture and sensitivity or microscopic examination. Bloody fluid usually suggests trauma. Purulent fluid is diagnostic for infection. Serous fluid or clear may be associated with cancer, inflammatory conditions, or heart failure. When thoracentesis is done for therapeutic reasons, one to two liters of fluid may be withdrawn to relieve respiratory distress. Medication may be instilled directly into the pleural space to treat infection. Thoracentesis is done at the bedside or in a treatment or examining room. The client either sits at the side of the bed or examining table or is in a side-lying position on the unaffected side. If the client is sitting, a pillow is placed on a bedside table and the client rests his or her arms and head on the pillow. The physician determines the site for aspiration by radiography and percussion. The site is cleansed and anesthetized with local anesthesia. A needle or small tube is inserted between the ribs and into the pleural space to withdraw fluid. When the procedure is complete, a small dressing <clears throat> is applied. The client remains on bed rest and usually lies on the unaffected side for at least one hour to promote expansion of the lung on the affected side. A chest x-ray is done after the procedure to rule out pneumothorax, also called collapsed lung. Complications that can follow a thoracentesis are pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, which is air in the subcutaneous tissue, infection, pulmonary edema, and cardiac distress. Nursing management. In addition to nursing management of individual tests, clients require informative and appropriate explanations of any diagnostic procedures they will experience. Nurses must remember that for many of these clients, breathing may be in some way compromised. Energy levels may be decreased. For that reason, explanations should be brief yet complete and may need to be repeated. The nurse also must help ensure adequate rest periods before and after the procedures. After invasive procedures, the nurse must carefully assess for signs of respiratory distress, chest pain, blood streaked sputum, and, expert, expert, uh, and bringing up uh, blood and sputum. The client should be repeatedly informed about post-procedure expectations to help reduce anxiety and ensure the best possible recovery. The physician orders arterial blood gases, ABGs, to determine various factors related to blood oxygenation. On a patient who presents in respiratory distress, what site can ABGs be obtained from? A, a puncture in the radial artery, B, the trachea and bronchi, C, a swab from the nasopharynx, or D, an IV catheter in the arm vein? The answer should be a puncture in the radial artery the rationale is that ABGs determine the blood's oxygen level and pH and levels of oxygen and oxygen carrying capacity, CO2 levels, and bicarbonate ion levels. Blood gas samples are obtained through an arterial puncture at the radial, brachial, or femoral, femoral artery.
nursing care plan for bronchoscopy. Nursing diagnosis would be fear, comma, risk for aspiration. Interventions. Acknowledge the fear. Give simple explanations. Inform that the client will receive medications for anxiety. Assess cough and gag reflex. Have available suction and put the patient in semi fowler's position. Report complications of pneumothorax, dysrhythmia, or bronchospasm. Outcomes. The client tolerates the procedure without negative effects and maintains patent airway and minimal potential complications. On your nursing care plan, outcomes would be your goals. Evaluation would come afterward. This is the end of the slideshow.